Yeah. Don't scare me. <laughs> <laughs> you're holding down there by your wife, man. You'll be all right. I will. <laughs> I was just saying how nice Linda is. <laughs> you even got the pastor laughing. We're going to be in um, Isaiah chapter 51. The church looks nice, Justin, tonight. Around here where y'all did all that work and stuff. She said she said she y'all were doing some good work tonight yesterday. Yeah, I get the get pressed. All the to me yesterday and got that done. It's it's beautiful. We ate well. We ate well. I will say that. We ate well. Do you want to use the microphone? No. Um, I will on Sunday. <laughs> Once we get the little clip back. Anyway, I'll just talk loud. Um, so we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 15, and really only have one blank to fill in for tonight on your notes, and it's a judgment against Moab. Moab uh, will be the blank there uh, for chapter 15, and really through 16. So... Um, And we should get through 15 minutes. There's only nine verses. <laughs> um, so here we talked last week about Philistia. And the, again, in these next few um, portions, we're talking about, uh, if, you, if you back up to verse 22 of chapter 14, uh, it was 22 and 23, we're talking about Babylon uh, destroyed. Also, then we go into from verse 24 down to verse 27. We see Assyria destroyed. Last week we covered from verse 28 uh, through the end of the chapter. Uh, Philistia destroyed, and, and and we were we mentioned last week here we are seeing God's judgment. Um, he's been judging Judah, but here now he's turned his wrath um, totally around against these ungodly nations. And we also meant, we've been mentioned, well, we've been mentioning that right along, is that he's not only going to judge Judah, but he's also going to judge these ungodly nations. And the reason is, is because he's still a holy God. And, and these are ungodly nations that are basically uh, going against his will and playing all together. Judah was, uh, and they were turning their back on God willfully. But here's ungodly nations, and they're totally going against God, and so he's judging them Right along. And we're going to get into a little bit of a backstory here with Moab tonight with our time. But here, notice, um, and well, let, me, let me go over a couple different points here just as we, just in introduction with this, to kind of get our heads around some of the backstory with Moab. Um, first of all, Moab, the founder of the people of Moab, was. Uh, the son born of the incestu incestuous relationship between Lot and one of his daughters. And if we go back to Genesis chapter 19, Genesis chapter 19 for this story, beginning in verse 30. And again, the founder of the people of Moab was the son born here uh, from one of Lot's daughters. And if you recall the story, we'll go through it here again. Genesis chapter 19, beginning verse 30. It says, Then Lot went up out of Zoar and, and dwelt in the mountains, and his two daughters were with him, for he was afraid to dwell in Zoar, and he and his two daughters dwelt in a cave. Now the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is no man on the earth to come into us as is the custom of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drunk with wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve the lineage of our father. So they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he did not know when, uh, when she lay down or when she arose. And it happened on the next day that the 
firstborn and said to the younger, Indeed, I lay with my father last night. Let us make him drink wine tonight also, and you go in and, and he and lie with him. Uh, go in and lie with him, that we may preserve the lineage of our father. Then they made their father drink wine that night also, and the younger arose and lay with him, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. Thus both the daughters of Lot were with child by their father. The firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab. But here we have uh, this portion as far as who Moab is. So here Moab, and he is the father of the Moabites to this day. And the younger, she also bore a son and called his name uh, Benami. Uh, and he is the father of the people of Ammon to this day. So here's some backstory. Um, that's a terrible story all the way around. Uh, you, you also see in with this how much the world had taken um, a hold of, of even those daughters of Lot. Uh, also, you see the, uh, the lack of trust in God. You see the lack of trust in God and his plans and his sovereignty over everything. And here these, these girls are fretting that they're not going to have any man and they're not going to have any lineage. And so they take it upon themselves instead of relying on God and his plan overall. And so then we fast forward here. And then we, here we see the, uh, again, in with this, the Moabites settled in the plains of the southeast. Uh, Moab at times, the Moabites were great enemies of Israel. We see this right along. Uh, it was Balak, the king of Moab, who hired Balaam, the prophet, hoping that he could curse Israel. And that's uh, seen in Numbers 22 all the way through Numbers 25. Uh, it was Eglon, the king of Moab, who oppressed Israel in the days of the judges. During the time of Saul and David, Israel established a firm control over Moab, but later kings of Israel were not always able to keep them under Israeli dominance. So here we see this, this history of Moab constantly in conflict uh, with Israel. Uh, also as well, David's Israel, David, Israel's greatest king, was one quarter Moabite. His paternal grandmother, Ruth, was from Moab, if you remember that account. And also David entrusted his father and mother to the protection of the king of Moab uh, when he was a fugitive from Saul. And we see that in 1 Samuel 22 and verses 3 and 4 there. So with all of this said, this is basically the backstory of, of basically Moab. And you see here, ultimately, and we're going to talk about that towards the end of our time tonight. But once again, you have to come back to the realization that uh, you think about our own lives and how that we need to be trusting in God ourselves. And also, we don't know where sin will end up. And where sin will carry us if we allow it to. If we don't see sin as God sees it, and we just let it go unabated, and, and not asking God for forgiveness, we never know where that's gonna, where we're going to end up with that. And here we see, even with those two girls, with Lot, his daughters, here they were not trusting in God, they were not trusting in his plan, and because of that sin, here we end up, here's the founder of, of the Moabites, and we see how they turn their backs on God, and it becomes almost generational. And here you have a group of people that are not even living for God at all. And where did it all start? It all started with the neglect of God, the neglect of his plan and his will. And so once again, it's a great lesson for us as well, even today, that we don't know where sin will end up. And if we're not following after God and his plan, and as we're, as we're um, being the testimony one way or another, uh, even to our children, to our grandchildren, uh, they're watching our pattern of life. Are they following after God with a pure heart, a whole heart? Or, or are we actually just following Him, you know, or maybe not following Him? Maybe out of fear, even at moments. So you need to be careful in that, don't we? So here, notice we begin here in verse 1, and it says, uh, The burden against Moab, because in the night, um, our of um, Moab is laid waste and destroyed. Um, and here it goes on, it says, because in the night here of Moab is laid waste and destroyed. 
He has gone up to the temple in Dabon, uh, to the high places to weep. Moab will wall, will wall over Nebo and over Mediba. On all their heads will be baldness, and every beard cut off. Here are a couple thoughts here under verse 1. Uh, God's announcing here coming judgment on Moab against these cities that are listed here. And each one of these are actually specific cities under Moab. And God announces, announces against, again, judgment here. And most of these sites were originally part of Israel's territory. When Moses and Joshua defeated Shihon, the king of the Amorites, uh, historically, and all the cities north of the Arnon River once belonged to the tribe of Reuben. Throughout the years, however, the Moabites had persistently pushed the Israelites out of these regions. And see, and then that's also one reason why God's coming up upon them now. Why? Because God had actually promised <coughs> these lands to Israel. Israel's no longer, at this point anyway, um, being the godly nation that they should be, they're, no, they're not um, obeying God as they should. And so here's God judging these nations himself. And so once again, it goes back to the reality that where we should be um, obeying God out of a pure heart and, and, and following after his will, no matter what that entails. Um, there's a lot of different reasons as to why Judah is in, this, in the predicament that they are right now. Uh, one of them is because they were uh, intermarrying one of, and taking wives from these other nations. Uh, they, their hearts, that's what, how they became so far away from God, uh, was because of this, and this was just part of it. Also, in verse 2, notice, notice verse 2 here. He says, he has gone up to the temple and, and Devon and to the high places to weep. Moab will wail over Nebo and over Medeba. And on their heads will be baldness and every beard cut off. And here the picture of, is of a Moabite man fleeing the destruction of the city, running to his temple. And by the way, these are ungodly individuals. So it's a pagan god they're running to. It's a pagan temple they're running into. And then also for protection and mourning. And so once again, is that going to help them? Absolutely not. No. Why? Because this is... The God, Jehovah, that's pouring out this judgment upon them. Uh, they're false gods. They're not going to save them. <laughs> um, it's, it's a, it's a um, foregone conclusion. And then we see in verse 3, notice verse 3, it says, In their streets they will clothe themselves with sackcloth. On the tops of their houses and in the streets, everyone will wail and weeping bitterly. And here at this point, point of the invasion, and as a result of it, there will be great distress and mourning in Moab. Um, and you would say, well, normally, why wouldn't God just, you know, see their crying, see all of this going on with the people? But once again, God's a, a just God. Um, there was a lot of mourning going on with Judah, and because of his justice, he still needed out the punishment. And we see that here, even with Moab as well. Uh, notice, we're going to look at one portion of scripture here. Uh, let's go to uh, Jeremiah chapter 48 just for a moment. Towards the end of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 48. Says the Lord that I shall send him wine workers 
who will tip him over and empty his vessels and break the bottles. And of course, it's not just talking about wine here, it's talking about judgment. And this is exactly what's going on. And notice, notice the wording here in verse 11. It says, Moab has been at ease from his youth. And what's going on here is the fact that they believe that just because they haven't seen any, anything from the hand of God, it says from their youth, that really nothing's going to happen. And that's, that's a false uh, premise, isn't it? And you think about even, even in our land here today, and as I was looking at these verses this, this week, you think about even our land today. You look around and you say, well, I don't see the hail, fire, and brimstone. So, you know, everything must be good. And that's not the case at all, is it? No. And you think about where our nation is as a whole, and I believe, and we've, we've mentioned that right along, that I believe what we're seeing right now is just God, and we mentioned that, where it's not always hell, fire, and brimstone. Sometimes it's just God removing his protection in his hand and letting everything just run its course. Right. And I believe that's exactly what we're seeing right now. We get what we get. Um, and just like in Judah, they were uh, the king's heart, and we've said that from the, from the very first chapter, Ahaz, his, king, his heart was far from God, and what happened? It was a trickle down. The king's heart was away from God, and he was the leader, and the people's heart became uh, foreign to God, and, and then you have this whole nation basically running in the opposite direction from godliness. And then what's going to happen? Judgment. Why? Because God's a holy God. He's going, he, he has to, um, to pour out judgment. And then you come back to these verses uh, here, and going back in um, Jeremiah, there in verses 11 and 12, and it says there again in verse 11, Moab has been at ease from his youth. He has settled on his dregs and has not emptied the vessel to vessel, nor has he gone into captivity. They even use that word. But then notice verse 12, it says, Therefore, behold, notice in quotation marks, Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I shall send him wine workers who will tip him over and empty his vessels and break the bottles. So basically there's a day coming. And so then as we go back to Isaiah here, chapter 15, we're seeing that day coming about. Um, God's a God of his word. And here we're seeing how that he's pouring out his judgment here. All right. And anybody have anything at this point? We're moving along, but anybody have any thoughts there? There's let me let me just say this. As we go through and as we look at God's word, I was thinking about this today too. As we look at God's word, um, wherever that might be. Uh, there's always the somewhat danger where we can look at different passages, which means a certain thing. Um, but yet how God speaks to our hearts through that can be in different ways. Uh, so I just want to point that out. Um, and so as we go through this, if God's word means what it says, but it, again, um, the Lord can speak to our hearts in many ways. And that's really ultimately the blessing of it. I think that's why... It's a living word. Uh, how that um, I can, and I've mentioned that before as an example. We can all read uh, Huckleberry Finn or Tom Sawyer or whatever you want to say, and we all come away with the same conclusions. But yet we see in um, in the Word of God we can read His Word, and the Lord can speak to our hearts in many different ways. So what a blessing that is! I thought it was interesting that mm -hmm. the city where Lot and his family were, it was destroyed. Mm -hmm. And as far as those girls knew, all the earth was destroyed, mm -hmm. you know? And yeah. I think it's a perfect example of them taking the situation into their own hands. Mm -hmm. And how often do we do that? We, we, we see a problem, we don't wait on the Lord, and we just jump right in there, and the next thing you know, we've messed things up, and the Lord's got to fix the first one and the second one, you know? So... Sure. Yeah, that's a good point. And uh, I, to be honest, I haven't really thought about it from that angle. But as far as with the um, them knowing that's all they yes. did. Right. That is true. You know, and then whenever you, then they have that situation going to the caves. I'm not, and trust me, I'm not in yeah. no way saying that 
anything they did was righteous, it wasn't at all. But the, but in with that, um, that was probably out, it was definitely out of fear what they did, mm -hmm. and 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 so doing even with that incestuous relationship, that was all they knew. They didn't right. know anything. Right. 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 Yeah, they were raised in Sodom. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. That's all they knew. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I hate, and we, I've talked about that before, I hate that story where um, the angels came to get them out and that whole situation, but mm -hmm. they weren't some just innocent girls either, in, in, in essence. Well, so, yeah, but they were babies. So much for were his daughters. They were little so. kids at one point, and they were mm -hmm. raised up in Sodom. That's... Yeah. And it also, it also you, you think about that whole story, uh, I know this is sort of an aside, a late aside, but... Um, you think about God's mercy and his grace, even in that whole situation, and he calls him just law. And um, that was always struck me, um, how that he calls him just law. But, yeah, so we see we see all of this, in, and you're exactly right. You know, because in as much as we want to um, judge them in our own hearts at times, sometimes we, if we're not where we should be with the Lord and following up his plan and realizing totally that his sovereignty is best. Um, you know, I was, I was um, texting back and forth with um, uh, Ralph McKenzie this afternoon and encouraging him that way. And just in all that he's going through right now, um, sometimes it's, especially with health situations, it's hard to see the end of the tunnel, the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak, where we're going through situations and unexpected situations and we wonder, you know, did God leave me and you know, those types of thoughts, maybe even at moments, but we have to realize that his hand is not, you know, coming off the wheel. He's still in control and we need to leave him as the captain, so to speak. All right, we'll go to um, verse five is, is where we left off here. Um, well, verse four, Heshbon and, and Aliyah, um, as far as Jahaz, therefore the armed soldiers of Moab will cry out. His life will be burdensome to him. So notice here, it's worth pointing out, it's not only the just the average citizens of Moab that are crying out. Notice here in verse 4, at the end it says, therefore the armed soldiers of Moab will cry out. And you think about that, God's judgment. It's not just some mamby-pamby judgment. Um, it's soldiers, the mighty men of war, they're crying out from God's judgment upon them. And notice it says at the end, his life will be burdensome to him. And then notice in verse 5 here, we, we pick up, it says, My heart will cry out for Moab. His fugitives shall flee to Zoar like a three-year-old heifer. For by the ascent of Lehoth, they will go up with weeping, for in the way of Aronium, they will raise up a cry of destruction. And here the connection is interesting because Zoar was the city, if you think about this, this was the city that Lot and his daughters escaped from, hiding in the mountains before Lot's daughters committed incest with their father and gave birth to the child Moab. So here, this is where they're going to flee to. So the people of Moab, they're fleeing right back to Zoar. And so that's interesting. And so here, this is where it all really in the end began, was at this very point. Uh, verse 6, where it says, For the waters of uh, Nimrim will be desolate, for the green grass has withered away, and the grass fails, and there is nothing green. And Ultimately, here the beautiful plains of Moab, which were known in the Bible, um, they were some of the best land um, at that point. And were wonderful grazing land, but now under the hand of God's judgment, it's all withered away. And you think about this, this is nothing about God's people that are doing this. This isn't a scorched earth policy. This is just God's judgment upon them. And you think about how that it's Ultimately, I was thinking about this uh, today. I came up with that um, 
It's going to Route 5 coming in today, and it was seeing some of the properties and all the green grass, and just, you know, my mind went back to this portion, and I was thinking about that. Really, it's the hand of God that allows us to have what we have, even in this nation. You think about the farmlands that we've had, and the bounty that we've had in this, in this nation that we've taken uh, for granted for generations and generations, ever since the founding, really. Um, and how that that can be all taken away by God's hand of judgment. And we would say, rightfully so. The it's going to affect us. The but Moabite probably thought it was global warming. What's that? The Mo Moabite probably thought it was just global warming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Old Testament yeah. global warming. Yeah, because that's what it is. <clears throat> Left over from the fallout of Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you, and then going into verse 7, it goes on and says, Therefore, the abundance, and because it says, the, well, let's go back to the end of verse 6, it says, The grass fails, there is nothing green. Verse 7, therefore, because of that, the abundance they have gained, and what they have laid up, they will carry away to the brook of the willows. And here, the picture is of fleeing refugees carrying all their possessions with them. They're just trying to basically escape. And, and the irony is here is that they're trying to escape from what? Ultimately, God's judgment. And that, that's not going to happen, right? So God's going to continue to judge them. There's no way from getting out from that. Um, and then verse 9, here the, or I'm sorry, verse 8. For the cry has gone all around the borders of Moab. It's wailing to Eglim. And it's wailing to Beer Elim, uh, for the waters of Dimon will be full of blood, because I will bring more upon Dimon, lions upon him who escapes from Moab, and on the remnant of the land. This last verse is quite the verse when you stop and really look at that. And here, in, in so number verse 8, where it talks about the cry has gone out all around the borders of Moab, here their pain in the midst of judgment would be evident to all. All the surrounding area, I mean, think about that. You say, well, they don't have telephones and all those things. Of course not. But word gets around when, you, when there's destruction. And here, this is happening in, in, in place after place. And, and by the way, as they're trying to escape, it's just that the judgment is just following them. That's what's happening here as far as the picture. And then as we see here at the end of verse 8, where he says everyone around the borders of Moab would see God's judgment against them. So again, it's following after them. Then you come to verse 9. Look at verse 9 there. It says, uh, for the waters of Dimon will be full of blood. Why? Because I will bring more upon Dimon. And then notice the end of verse 9. It says, lions upon him who escapes from Moab and on the remnant of the land. So here, if the judgment of the night attack did not complete the work of judgment, God would send ultimately lions, actual lions. This isn't figurative. He's going to bring lions, it says, upon him who escapes, and God will then finish his work of judgment. And you think about that in other verses in the Old Testament. It says basically even if, it even talks about even in, in praising the Lord, if People don't praise the Lord. He'll make even the rocks to cry out. So it's nothing for him to tell lions to go and basically finish his judgment upon his creation. Um, it's a very morbid type of picture. <coughs> but it also tells you how just God is. And he's a God of his word. And he's going to carry it out. And a lot of people don't like reading. Who, who likes reading those verses? But once again, we come back to the reality here, even in the end of this chapter, where what was it that caused all this to come about? It's sin. That's what we have to keep coming back to. Um, it, and it's not just for Judah. It's for every one of these groups of people. It's ultimately sin in direct violation and disobedience to God. And I, I wrote this down um, just in conclusion. Um, it behooves us to remember that God does not forget or gloss over our sins. Also, we may not be judged immediately, but God will judge sin and disobedience, even in our own hearts. Uh, and
And then I went back to talking about Lot's daughters made a selfish choice instead of trusting in Jehovah, whose plans are always best. And the offspring were reaping generations later due to their own disobedience and godlessness. Think about that. Because of their distrust in God and his plans to be carried out, here generations later, here you see God pouring out his judgment of, 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 upon this godless people. But where did it all start? In, in forgetting God, in sin. And then I put this in just in the end. Our sin um, is due, uh, there's, or our sins are ultimately due to um, our own selfishness. And no one is left blameless before God and is important to teach each generation about Him. And that's really what really blares out, especially as you're going through even these various uh, chapters here. And sometimes if we're not careful, I was thinking about this in the study, uh, even for tonight, is as we're going through and we're talking about these various uh, people, we can be, at, even as believers in, in God, we can say, well, you know, Judas didn't, but they're, they're just deserved in a sense because of their sinfulness and turning their back. These other nations are getting what they're getting because basically they were just godless nations. But ultimately, everyone knew about God to begin with. No one is left um, without excuse, in essence. And then it again goes back to the reality that we need to be telling each generation about the Lord. We need to be doing our part. He'll do his, and he'll redeem his own. But it's up to us to be able to go and tell people about the Lord. And so that's really what it comes down to. And it's not just about the love of God, but even sharing as we are tonight. There's, there's a holy, he's a holy God. And he's also a just God who's going to mete out justice as, as, and as he sees fit, and rightfully so. And so once again, we see that blaring out even here tonight in this chapter 15. So. All right, any other thoughts here tonight? Justin, back mm -hmm. to that, like the two daughters, and I look at Lot's wife, too, also, you know, God went through great efforts to save her, to get her out of there, mm -hmm. and she showed that there wasn't any true repentance with her at all. She looked back and wanted to ruin She's going to miss what she Mom. did. Right. And it's a shame the daughters didn't yeah. come to the point of repentance also, which, mm -hmm. once again, they didn't. Great lessons for us too, isn't it? And you know, really, I look at I look at these verses, even though sometimes they're hard to read, to be quite honest. Um, but as you read them and apply them, um, we really should thank the Lord for them, because in the end, it shows us that this same holy God that's going to keep His word and is going to judge sin is going to judge my sin if I have sin in my own. And the same goes for you. And so we need to continually keep that in our minds and in our hearts. That we should be, and, and again, we shouldn't be obeying him like, you know, oh, he's going to judge me. We should be doing what we're doing out of a heart of love for him. Because he's given us that spirit. He's given us that heart. And the more that we get, the, the more that we continually please him, the more that we're into his word, I believe that we're being a, that love for him is going to grow and it's going to be easier to please him in our lives. It doesn't mean that, that Satan and sin is not going to try to creep in, but I believe it's going to be far um, easier to, to dispel it if we're following after God. So. All right. Well, we'll pick up there in chapter 16.
and we have that listed there. So we pray for Terry, and she's going to be having the breast cancer surgery on the 22nd. And um, again, this is Ray and Alice Johnson's daughter, so be praying for her if you would. Um, Terry had given us an update yesterday on Margaret Tigner, uh, Chris's mom, and she, um, she's no longer eating or drinking anything at this point. So um, continue to pray there for her and her family. Um, I did send a uh, email to Chris um, twofold. One, the main was, of course, to let him know personally that we're, we've been praying for the family and for him. Um, and also for him at whatever point is convenient to inform us uh, when or if they're going to be coming home. Um, so anyway, so we're waiting for a response there from Chris. But continue to pray for the family. And um, I, I couldn't imagine, I, Jeremy and I were talking about that the other day, I couldn't imagine being Chris where God's called him but yet, knowing that your mom and your dad are in the, the situations that they are. So, really be praying for their family, if you would. Um, uh, continue to pray for Michael Gwaltney and thank for his uh, recovery. Any any other updates there, Michael? Or? I went to the doctor this week and things look good. Okay. didn't get much rest last night and was very uncomfortable with his attending nurse. Wasn't comfortable with her, so they just, just had a really bad night. Uh, still nauseous and pain. Uh, uh, and x-rays, x-rays and new medication needs to be ordered. Uh, the physical therapy did not go well. As he stood up, his um, to his walker, he literally passed out, and his daughter, who's a nurse, was there. She caught him, so kept him from falling. But uh, but it was strictly a blood pressure issue, and uh, that's that's all Mary put in here. So um, bottom line, just not a very good day. Not a good night last night, and not a good not today. Yet. Mary, I, mean, I had a lengthy talk with Mary yesterday, and she's just so worried about the level of pain that Ralph is in, but it's just going to be that way for a while. So we really get the healing. And, uh, and they've got to get all these other things straight so they can get even to the physical therapy and everything else. So we'll continue to treat Brother Ralph if you would, and for Mary. As we 
you know, when uh, one spouse is down and the other one is rallying. And so, so can you pray for uh, Randy Mitchell? We begin this therapy on the 30th uh, and talking with um, Wanda. So continue to pray for him. Uh, this is more of a joke, but we pray for Wanda. UNC lost, so <laughs> morning. And I was I was texting her. I texted her that night. Uh, you know, we were watching. I don't know the camera. I don't know what to do. But anyway, um, and I, and I texted her, and it was right whenever um, UNC was starting to lose and really bad. And uh, I texted her. I said, Hey, I was wondering if I could chat for about an hour with you about something. And she put back up these like crazy faces, like right now. We don't have question marks. But anyway, I told her I'm just joking. She's not watching the game. You know, got a good laugh about that. But uh, continue to pray for Randy. And they did get his um, ramp installed at his house so that whenever, and that was one of the major points of him even being able to get home uh, because he didn't even have a way to get into his house. So they were able to install the ramp. Um, like Bill has at his house, and so that was a blessing. So, um, so can you pray for Randy and for his healing? Uh, can you pray for Sally Prince, and she's now in hospice care and um, continuing to have the seizures? So, can you pray for, for, pray for her and her uh, family? Um, can you pray too for Lisa uh, and Joey? They're going to be going home at the end of this week, so be praying for them if you would. Justin, do you know if these seizures are painful? Um, <clears throat> they, they, they've given, them medicine, given her medicine to be able to cut basically the pain. Okay. Uh, so, but I know when I was over there the other day, um, she, was, she had just had one of those like 45 minutes. Wow. And um, mm -hmm. so that's kind of Continue to pray for John, John Rhodes, too, and um, we put, put him in here as well. Just continue to pray for him, and I know we've been, we continue to pray for Beth, but pray for John, too. And those of you that have ever been a caregiver, you know what that's about. And so we pray for him, um, just emotionally and physically and everything that goes with it. So we pray for John, if you will. Didn't he come by here the other day with you? He did. We had a really and good that's chat. good. That yeah. is good. He just, he know, he took time to come by. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and then they've, um, with Beth, they've also basically got her set up on the upstairs with um, everything that she needs up there now. So that's um, to help her. So that's been a blessing. Uh, continue to pray for Ron Tigner and for, for his health as well. And I think that's all I had at this point for updates. Yes, Terry. Betty gave you a note on Sunday for us to pray for her. She leaves tomorrow morning. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, pray for Betty Cole. Um, she's leaving to uh, go out west to meet up with Peggy. With Peggy. 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 Sorry, we want Yes, with Peggy. And uh, then she'll be back. Sandra Brookman, you can take her off. Sandra Brookman. Die. 
mine and name on the board. I address one lost the husband. Maybe some of the women can send a card and write to the church. You know, that would be good. Because she don't have a church home and she's grieving a lot. So maybe, you know, they could send her. Because you don't know how far that will go, you know, for, for the women to, to uh, be compassionate and, and reach out to her. Because she's hurting now. Sundays in there too. Some of these women, we don't know who else. A lot of them send their little cards and all, you know. And that means a lot, you know. Mm -hmm. Have you heard anything from Frank and Shirley, how they doing? Not in the last week. But okay. Yeah. We were over there about a week, week and a half ago. And um, anyway, Frank's, Frank's coming along and um, just having difficulty with just mobility and whatnot. Right. So, and some other health issues. Right. And then one thing that people don't realize, losing your driving from here, mm -hmm. being able to drive, that, that hurts a lot when you can get, because you start feeling where you, you know, it really scares you a little bit, you can't get around nothing. But I guess it was a situation that, you know, I don't know, we rode by his house and all looked at, he still got his vehicles and everything. And Mike could go up there, uh, can they see people? Oh yeah. Oh okay, but yeah. they can they can get to the door with another time. Yes. Yeah. 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 What in the living world? I ain't listening, Justin. I'm glad he started. I get him to talk to me. Did you see us? I didn't see us there, but I thought I was scared. But me and her both got pains. <laughs> to continue to pray for uh, Joey and just uh, for her health overall and um, we miss her when she's not here so we yeah. pray for her alright anyone else um good friend of mine Donnie Bell um for salvation I took him out on the river today he, he's got a big tournament coming up next week and this place is going to be hopping by the way because it's a big tournament it's going to be like 250 boats so and it's all going out of osborne uh starting next thursday but he got in it and he wanted me to show him some stuff on the water today so we were out there and i said i'll take you out and show you if you let me talk to you about the lord he goes oh yeah absolutely but once we started talking about it it was so um at first i hate to say this but at first i forgot and the lord reminded god was I had planned on doing it and then he happened to ask me, he goes, how many more days are you going to work at the church this week? And that was my opening. And because I was sitting there up there fishing, going, well, that's my opening. <laughs> you know what I mean? Now I, gotta, now I gotta do it. So, and he's just like so many of my other friends. Um, he just, I asked him, I said, if you were to die right now, where would you go? He goes, well, I, I believe in God. And I said, well, you know, Satan believes in God. And I said, surely you don't think he's going to heaven. So we got talking a little more and a little more. And he was really open to it. He, he was really open to it. And uh, I've been there before. I've had a guy kneel down in my boat and get saved before, which was, it was a young kid. He was like 16. And um, I just, it was, uh, it was moving for him and me. But I felt like at one point, we talked about it for a while, but then I almost felt like he just wanted to do it just to get it over with. And I said, no, Donnie, I don't want, I don't want anything that's on the surface. It's got to come from here, not, not here. 
And uh, so I told him tonight, I said, when you go to bed tonight, if you lay there in that bed and toss and turn, wondering about where you're going to spend eternity, that's going to be the Holy Spirit dealing with you. And then if you want to know more, if you want me to sit down and take a Bible and show you, we can do that. So just pray that the Holy Spirit deals with him tonight. Amen. Just to show you, you know, I mean, you never know. You know, he doesn't just deal with people here, and that's the blessing, you know. And, and, uh, well, that's what I told him. You said something about it, uh, and it's true. You said something. I think it was last Sunday or Sunday before that. It's really. We're supposed to plant the seed and let God do the work. And so many times we just want to force them, just get down on your knees and pray with me, but it's not legit, it's not real. Right. You know, he needs to see, he needs to see that he's lost before he can take that next step. Has he ever been to this church? No. Okay, because you know, I don't know if he was here or not, Justin. Pastor Lieber was here. When we had one of them bass people come and park over here, was he here? Yeah, he was a believer. <laughs> he actually would come to and uh, he would come to the Wednesday, uh, Wednesday night services whenever uh, he would come through because they had the tournament at the end of the week. And he would, and uh, yeah, he had a little trailer and his bass boat and everything. And then uh, and anyway, he would come to the services too. It was always a pleasure to have him. Right. He hasn't been here a few years now. Right, so this is a different one. Good to have him on fast people, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, he's, yeah, it's not that guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, the same guy you saying? No, it's not. This, this guy I'm talking about owns James River Tackle Company in Hopewell, Tackle Store, right there on City Point. So... tonight uh, for the Easter lilies and we'll have them again available on Sunday. Uh, the cost is $8. Um, I'll be honest with you. I said $8 on Sunday and then after I said that, Jennifer asked me, did you actually look to see what they were? And I was like, no, I was hoping they were $8. <laughs> so we looked them up, they're $8. I was like, whew. <laughs> so anyway, $8. So anyway, but it's a slip. You can just put your name and how many ever you would like and then turn it in. So we'd appreciate it. Him and Jennifer has some compassionate talks sometimes. Yeah.